Tom here from Lawrence Systems. Are you setting up a new XCP and G server? I've got you covered. In this video, I'll walk you through the best practices for hardware, storage, networking, security, and backups. Everything you need to build a reliable, high-performance virtualization stack. And this isn't theory, it's based on my years of consulting with businesses running XCP and G in production environments. My goal here is to help you set things up right the first time so you don't have to hire me. But hey, you still can by heading over to lawrencesystems.com, clicking that Hire Us button at the top, so let's get started. You'll find this over in my forums. There's a link in the description below, and it's how to set up XCPNG right the first time. And I want to start with some of the hardware planning. This is a few questions that people may have about how to set this up. Now, what hardware is supported is the first part that sometimes causes confusion for people coming from the world of VMware, where VMware will deprecate certain older systems and not allow it to be supported. This is not the case with Zen server. You can put this on older servers, newer servers, or even mini PCs. Generally speaking, as long as it's x86 and supports virtualization, it generally works well with Zen. There's going to be some minor problems you may find with certain ones, but most of your enterprise hardware I've never had a problem on, and even many mini PCs that newer AMD ones especially have worked really, really well for virtualization. But RAID is where you can get hung up because there's a few different options here. If you have a pair of drives, it does support mirrored software RAID. If you have more than two drives, it's not going to do anything more than mirror two of them. That's all that's built into XCPNG. You can go from the command line. It is just using MDADM at the back end, so you can manipulate it to do something that it wasn't designed to do out of the box, but it can be a way to set it up. So officially, it only supports mirrors on install, but you can do more. The better way to set this up might be to have a hardware RAID controller, such as like a Dell server with one of their RAID controllers built in, where you have the Dell server managing the RAID and you present it as a drive to XCPNG. That's a really common scenario for people setting up single servers. We'll talk more about storage in a moment down below. Hardware RAID controllers are good, but not all of them support pass-through. You can use a standard HBA though that does support pass-through if you'd like to use something like ZFS. I've got a whole video on that. And by the way, I've got a lot of different videos linked down below here to each of these topics. And some of them are around storage. There's actually several videos just on that topic and we'll get there in a moment. Now, hardware in terms of network cards, it will work fine with a single network interface, but generally our enterprise production ones are gonna have many network interfaces. I often, because one gig interfaces are so common, leave the one gig as the management interface, then you can take the other NICs and maybe bond them together. That is a well-supported scenario. I usually leave the management off of the bond. That way, if you ever screw the bond up, you also don't screw up your management ports at the same time. But having many network interfaces allows you to segment and offload things in a more sane way, especially when it comes to performance. Now, initial install config, you download it for free, right from XCPNG, no registration. This is fully open source. But have your IP scheme understood of how you plan to set it up. Don't use DHCP unless it's just for testing and testing sometimes in the lab environments and now it goes, well, I've put a lot of things in here, so now it's production. But before you start tying a bunch of hosts together in a cluster, make sure you have static IP set on those so you don't, well, break things. You can recover from it, but it's a lot more work and way less work just to set it up right from the beginning. Having a host naming scheme, definitely think about how you want to name them, but the good news is you can rename them later, but just for your sanity's sake, have a common way incrementally naming them that makes sense to you. And of course, I got my getting started video linked right here. Now it is April of 2025, and this is a 2024 video that was done later. I will do eventually a new video. And while this particular video is static, the site link here is not. So I will be updating this if there's a newer version of some of these videos or any things that need to be added, I'll put them in this particular forum post. I also have one on building XO from sources. So if you're doing this on the side of, I want to play this in my lab and I don't want to buy the fully delivered XOA version from them, I have a video on how to set that up. Security wise, good news is the defaults are quite secure. You don't have to do a whole lot of hardening to this. The firewall is enabled by default. Disable SSH password authentication and use keys for access. That's a great idea. I definitely recommend that. That is something that is turned 
off by default because you have to set a password. So when you're setting a password, you got to log in. Then when you log in, then you can disable that. But other than that, I would say there's not a whole lot else you have to do to really lock these down. But I will mention, of course, use VLAN to separate network and limit the exposure of your management interfaces. I have people that talk about putting these management interfaces on public IP addresses. It's a horrible idea. Please don't do that. Uh, and also just keep it up to date. General maintenance, good idea. You also get new features frequently as part of the updates that come with it. Now let's talk storage. Local storage. SSD or MVME work great. You can install XCPNG to a pair of drives, a single drive, and use the extra space not used for the host OS for the VMs to work as a storage repository. But of course, if you're not using something that's fast, it's going to perform really poorly. So it will work with HDD. You'll just be really disappointed by the results. Local ZFS, as I mentioned, is an option, but there is no management plane for it. You can't manage it through XO. It's not even showing in the web interface. In my video for how to set up ZFS in there, I explain how to set up the command line, but that's also where you'd manage any of the features of ZFS. Prefer EXT over LVM. This is the question it asks you on install when you're setting up the local storage, and thin provisioned is the reason you want to go with EXT, and it's also not blocked based, so it's much easier to manage and recover, but they still do have the LVM as an option if you so choose it, but I would leave it at EXT. Coming down to external storage. NFS is preferred over iSCSI. That is just a simpler way to do it. It is a simpler integration. It is easier to recover from because it's file-based. It Use MC lag for redundancy because this is the next question to come up that's covered in iSCSI is, well, what about setting up full multipath or resiliency? Because if I'm connecting to a NAS over iSCSI, what if that switch fails? MC lag is your solution for that. That's what we do for our enterprise clients. And I will admit, depending on the target device, Maybe slightly lower performance in iSCSI in some edge cases. iSCSI sometimes does really well with small writes, sometimes better than NFS, but specifically on hardware such as Synology, I completely understand that iSCSI is going to be the better choice if you have a Synology because any testing I've ever done with Synology always shows me NFS to perform less on the same hardware than an iSCSI connection to that same device. Now, iSCSI is, of course, supported. Multipath is supported. It is not thin provisioned. And as I mentioned, block, not file based. For anyone who's not familiar with that, do a little bit of reading and you'll understand that when you have that managing the block device, you add a lot of complexity to recovering a single VM that may have gotten corrupted within that block, especially if you're doing something like snapshots on iSCSI that's pointed at a ZVAL. So it adds a little bit more complexity. If you're very familiar and you're very comfortable with iSCSI, not a big deal. But please note the not thin provision applies no matter well, whatever your knowledge level is with iSCSI. And of course, let's come down to hyperconverge. ExoStore, which is based on DRDB, storage is replicated across all nodes, allowing VMs to survive host failures. That's a big thumbs up. No need for a dedicated external NAS. That's great. This is where people run into problems with hyperconverge. This is not an XCPNG problem. This is a problem for any hyperconverged setup. It is heavy network dependent to get the syncing to happen between these. So depending on the configuration, when you write to the VM, it has to synchronize and validate that it is synced to the other hosts, or it wouldn't be hyperconverged. That means it's going to have to be bottlenecked at whatever the network speed is. That can have a much higher latency on writes without really performant hardware, and only suitable when consistent low latency networking is available between the nodes. And I bring this up because I've had people have real problems setting up hyperconverged when the compute and the hyperconverged and everything is fighting for resources because your VMs are doing things and the hyperconverged is trying to also use those compute resources to synchronize across all the hosts. And if you don't have enough dedicated, as I mentioned earlier, multiple NICs to get this data all the way across there, you can have real performance issues with it. So sometimes it's better to go with an external NAS and what you think you're saving by not buying an external NAS, you spend on more performant hardware and more performant networking interfaces to facilitate being able to sync between all of them. But it's supported. These are all different options for setting it up. And of course, I got my XCPNG storage guide, NFS storage, how to do ZFS storage. And that brings us down to some VM management best practices, which are actually pretty simple here. Use a rational naming scheme. I do a lot of consulting where people have, uh, well, 
watching them be confused by the naming scheme on there. Come up with something that works really for you. Production app 01, lab win 10 02. If you have multiple servers, you can incrementally name them. Easy once you come up with a scheme that everybody follows because, well, it'll just help your sanity. Tag by role, department, or environment. Useful for automation, filtering, and backups. I love the tagging system. There's a lot of ways you can set defaults on tags for different views. These views help you in management when you're trying to find something. And we've done a lot of systems for companies that may have as many as a thousand VMs. And if you don't have a sane way to manage a thousand VMs, well, that single pane of glass can be kind of foggy to read through. Putting these tags on there and filtering by tag makes it a lot better. Storage design. VMs are ideal for running compute workloads, but storage should be handled externally when practical. Watch my video on storage design. I've referenced this many, many times. Don't stick way too much data inside of a VM. VMs are designed to be your compute workload and whatever they're working on. If they're managing some large database, that database doesn't necessarily work as well stuffed into a VM because you're virtualizing a disk. That's where I have my storage design video. Watch that. It covers like better practices to do it. And such as like tying an iSCSI extent to a Linux machine or to a Windows machine to get better performance. Your database will thank you later. Don't over provision. Don't over provision CPU or memory. Uh, if you're wondering what happens, I have a video on over provisioning CPU in memory. So there's scenarios where you may want to do that. I'll walk you through that in those videos. Generally speaking, avoid it if you can. Put more memory in or get a system with more CPUs. That's going to be a better solution. Backup strategy. Use XO backups. They're integrated and easily automated. Keep your backups on separate storage. Yes, if you are running a NAS, don't back up to that NAS unless you're backing it up again somewhere else. That is uh, a much better situation to not have your backups the same place as those. Test your restores regularly because successful backup does not mean tested restore. This is where I have the backup video, a disaster recovery video on how to automate this, including full testing. And you can do validation testing on the same server or even on a different server and fully automate that. I cover that in those videos there. Networking. Have a clear naming scheme. Take advantage of the description field. That way, if you have multiple admins, not just you knows where those networks go and we avoid confusion of assigning the wrong network to the wrong virtual machine. Name the unused interfaces. I name them not in use, but you could call them not in use and even put emojis in there because that is supported in XO and put a little red checkbox to make sure people are very clear this network isn't in use. That way, if you ever have a VM that just for some reason won't get an IP address because you've accidentally assigned it to the wrong not in use VM, you'll at least see that it'll be an obvious, easy fix. Segment management VM and storage traffic. Use VLANs or separate NICs. As I mentioned, if you have many network interfaces, that's a great way to do it. If you only have one, you can create a series of VLANs. Management interface using a dedicated NIC if possible, not a bonded interface. This will save you, especially this not a bonded interface one, when you accidentally goof something up on the switch or you goof something up in XCPNG and the bond type, and then, well, you break the bond and then you don't have the way to get into management. Having those one gig NICs assigned to management makes life easy. Dedicated backup storage and migration network. This is a way around. If you assign a one gig NIC to management, you're going, well, that'll bottleneck things like storage transfers or VM migrations or backups, et cetera, to that one gig NIC. No, you can actually have the management on the one gig NIC and still have a separate network for doing the other options, such as dedicating storage, backups, et cetera, to it. This is set on the pool level, so you can create those extra interfaces and then assign them on the pool. Please remember, and I've covered this before in the networking one, you need to assign IP addresses to the system, not just build the networks for each host. It has to have an IP address in those networks in order for it to communicate and send the data across. Maintenance and monitoring. Set up XO emails. This is really easy with their plugin. Just throw your SMTP server details in there. Use syslog. Send data to a syslog server. I like Graylog. I've got a video on it. It's free if you're interested. Documentation and scaling. Keep a config doc or run book. You may not be building these very often, especially if you're in an enterprise environment. You don't rebuild this all the time. So maybe you don't remember how you set it up, but your documentation will save you in case you have to set up more later on. Include the IPs, host name, pools, etc. This also helps when things go down and you're scratching your head going, well, let's look at how we think it was configured last based on this document. Use tags. They're more than just VM tags. You can use tags everywhere. Storage, hosts, 
pools, et cetera. This really helps, especially at large scale environments. We have clients that have one instance of XO and are managing multiple XCPNG at multiple data centers. Using tagging can really help with the filtering and understanding where things are, or what those resources are dedicated to. Those tags can be location. Those tags can be year they were installed to, if that matters. You can put a lot of tagging on these and good descriptions to really help make your life a lot easier. And Netbox support. Netbox is an open source tool that's been around for quite a while that helps you with documentation for IT assets and includes plugins for all kinds of things in the IT world, including XCPNG. So a lot of you may already be using this, so you'd be happy to hear that XCPNG has it, or maybe this is the first time you heard about Netbox. And uh, it's definitely a really neat project. Go ahead and check it out. I do not have a video on it as of this recording, but I plan on one in the future. And especially if I do want an XCPNG, I'll be including it in this forum post. Now, this last video I have linked here is admin tips and disaster recovery. If there's a series of things up above that you're learning about now and you've done some wrong and you need to maybe change IPs after you've built a cluster of systems and high availability, I have instructions on how to do that in this video. This is some tips for when you didn't follow these tips. These are tips to solve some of the problems or maybe you're fixing and cleaning up something someone else set up. Uh, that's what this video is all about right here. Now, I love hearing from you, so leave those thoughts and comments down below. Join my forums, forums.lawrencesystems.com, where you'll find that post, and you can engage with that post if you have some questions. You can leave them in the comments, but obviously more in-depth discussions and links. Well, YouTube doesn't allow that, so uh, that's why I have my forums. Like and subscribe to see more content from the channel, and head over to lawrencesystems.com, where you can connect with me on whatever socials you'll find me on there. All right, and thanks.